Welcome to the flip side of crypto. Joining me as always, Tor Constantino. Welcome, Tor. Good to see you again, Martinez. How are you doing today? Better than I deserve. First news to start off with. Miami starts a crypto experiment. They are launching a city's own cryptocurrency. Exciting news or baffling news? Which one is it for you, Tor? I, I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, as you said, Miami Coin will allow investors in Miami for buying or mining the coin. The funds will be used for the city's infrastructure or events projects, and those coins will then be converted by the city into U.S. dollars. And the uh, investors will be able to stack Miami Coin and earn rewards. To me, it's, it's similar to a combination of like a reward token and a municipal bond almost to make the bond more interactive it's a novel way to raise money, and I think it's a good thing. Um, I, I don't think that the, the residents will be able to use Miami Coin outside of Miami, but it's still very, very provocative. Could you just explain to this? Uh, explain this to me, as if I'm five. So they can only receive USD, right? So uh, because I have a quote here, essentially. There's state and federal laws forbidding Miami from accepting other currencies than the U.S. dollar. Is, so what's the point of the Miami coin then if it's not easily converted? Could you just elaborate and maybe explain to me how will this whole work? So what, what I think is what I think Miami is trying to do. It's like if the if the city was trying to hold an auction, if they had like physical goods, like a a, a tractor, let's say, or or some yeah. building that they wanted to sell, and they've got the proceeds in U.S. dollars. That's fine, but the physical asset is not U.S. dollar. And I think that what they're trying to do here is they're trying to sell digital assets or Miami coin in exchange for US dollars. That's how I think it's going to work. And I think that's how they get around those federal and state restrictions. Gotcha. Because in essence, it's quite exciting that we will now have city coins. But uh, what's the future then? The flip side to it is, will we have London coin? Will we have New York coin? Uh, when it's time for, you know, Dubai coin, I think uh, we'll see an interesting future ahead of us. Indeed, it, it definitely is an exciting time. I, I think that these use cases for these types of city city coins will be hyper local and will not be used in other cities, but it's still a great way for these municipalities to boost their own visibility and their own profile. Interesting stuff. In other news, digital asset investment products see outflows for the fourth week in a row. Do you have anything to comment about this occurrence? Well, I think when you look at the total outflows of 19 million this week and 295 million since mid-May, some people think that that's, that's a bad sign. I don't think so. I think that this is another indicator that we can expect to see price increases for Bitcoin and Ethereum respectively, and possibly for the entire altcoin category as well. That when, when we see big moves off of exchanges of these coins, that means they're not being traded. They're not in circulation. So there's going to be a supply squeeze. And we know that as supply decreases, that price increases. Basic economics, that's a good thing. And in essence, what gives us an indicator that this is an institutional player doing this, that this is not a retail trader? Well, they can look at, like you're saying, on-chain metrics, and they can they can see where the movement is occurring. But to your point, it's becoming increasingly difficult to identify where the big whales, the ones that hold more than 100 Bitcoins when they're moving them, because what we're seeing is that they're, they're opening smaller wallets and making smaller incremental moves so that they're not shifting the market and, and drawing unnecessary attention. It's harder to watch. And to your point, it is becoming trickier with some of these new tactics that the whales are using to move their funds around. Absolutely. Just a quick flip side to this. I think people focus a bit too much on the way that money and in this case, crypto is moving around. I think they're losing sight on the technology and they're losing sight on the regulatory environment. I mean, if they if people could see as transparently how real capital moves, fiat capital moves, 
like they can on crypto. They will understand that the world is a very bloody dynamic place. And if they try to unscrew this unsolvable Rubik's Cube, they would say, all right, I give up. Money is moving. That's fine. Don't try to make too much more fuss about it. Completely agree. Makes a lot of sense. This is just the basic inflows and outflows of capital. Now, in news which might shake the market, actually, Binance. It's suspending ETH and ERC-20 token deposits and also has been banned by the HSBC. I, I think the, the first one, though, as far as them suspending transactions for ETH and their um, ERC-20 tokens, I think that they're just being cautious and they want to avoid problems for users um, on their platform. Historically, as you know, hard forks can be bumpy for hodlers. It's marked by higher volatility. And that's saying something for the crypto space yeah. if you have more volatility, particularly around hard forks. But the other piece of news that HSBC, the sixth largest bank, is suspending crypto credit card payments, that's not a good sign for Binance. And they have come under scrutiny a from a regulatory perspective for their tokenized securities. They've also suspended futures and options trading in Europe. This is, this is a, a, another trend line now in the negative for Binance they just don't need. For the viewers at home, please comment down below. Are you using Binance? And if so, what are your moves? Are you leaving Binance for another exchange? Or are you sticking with it? Why and why not? And a flip side to this whole Binance debacle, Binance got too big too soon. Actually, they made themselves so such a target that right now to be a regular and not attack this behemoth seems like uh, missing an opportunity because this would show, this will build a roadmap for future regulators. Indeed it will, indeed it will. And the other thing, when you look at its, its founder CZ, that he's trying to step down and get a, a succession plan in place for himself, I think that he's trying to instill a reboot, a regulatory reboot to say, hey, we're going to start fresh and we're going to work with regulators. But it, it could be a long time before they get their ducks in a row, so to speak. Now, in other news, Australian exchanges, CoinJar and Independent Reserve. Well, uh, what can you say about this particular piece of news? So I think it's interesting. I think that, uh, again, CoinJar is in Australia. They're launching a credit card there, a crypto credit card. That's a positive, number one. Yeah. And then Australia has authorized another exchange, uh, independent reserve in, uh, in that country. That's another positive. And just as we were talking about how um, it, it seems that the outback is moving to the upfront as they're embracing uh, cryptocurrencies, if you will, and just as we were talking about these trend lines for Binance in the negative, these are positive trend lines moving up for, uh, for Australia. So it seems that uh, down under, if you will, is moving up on the uptrend regarding cryptocurrencies. <laughs> yeah, and Australia has historically been a place where uh, you see some quite liberal laws coming out and in some cases quite conservative laws coming out. They were, for example, very hard on tobacco, one of the first countries to be so hard on it. Uh, but on crypto, it seems like they are more liberal, more accepting. And it's an interesting dynamic which they have with the whole space. Indeed, it re really is interesting. And, and the thing is, is when you just kind of take a step back and we can see the dynamics that different geographies and different municipalities are having different approaches to this particular asset class are pretty remarkable. We've talked about some here. Miami, where they're adopting their own coin. HSBC in London, they're taking a different stance. Australia is taking a different stance. All of these variabilities just are kind of, it, it's still exciting to see how yeah. all of this is changing. It's such a dynamic place right now to be in cryptocurrencies and blockchain. Absolutely. However, we cannot talk about excitement without mentioning NFTs. The NFT boom continues. I mean, 300 million in weekly trades and CryptoPunks renting. I mean, may I rant just a little bit or sorry, I'll cut into your time, but I am 
the most excited person I usually meet when it comes to the potential for the NFT market. I, I see the potential. I see so much art, so much creativity, but for the love of me, I cannot understand why people are so focused on these numbers. It's sold for X million. It's sold for, you know, uh, to this person or to this person. It's all commercialized. And to think that it all started with a group of people who are actually fighting for ideas, who are fighting for decentralization. And right now, what are we celebrating? Stoner cats? C crypto punks? Uh, at some point, you kind of want to, you know, gouge your eyes out and just say, okay, so this is the reality. It's making people money, yay, but uh, this is short term. This is not what's going to be our children's art, so to speak. They might see it in a museum one day. You're exactly right about that. These are the early days of NFTs, and these are the things that are capturing everybody's attention are the collectible nature of them right now. The Beeples, the NBA All-Star platforms, the Stoner Cats, as you're saying, all of those types of um, applications for it are, are pretty much auctions and art exchanges. But to your point, the, the use cases for NFTs are remarkable and I completely agree that they will be the gateway for mass adoption because the use case are so extremely broad. It's We've seen it for streaming video, we've seen it for music launches. The Kings of Leon, they launched an entire album as an NFT platform as well as collectibles, but it's not just for that. We're going to see them for tickets for sporting events, for festivals, shopping coupons. It could even be for voting. That's how significant and serious this NFT technology and use case could be. That's very significant. And to your point, even for example, our new wall mural, which we just did, we'll show you, uh, audience at home, we'll show you a sneak peek of what we did there at the office. But in essence, even that could be an NFT. We could, for example, shard it out and just let each and every one of you own a little bit of that wall. Any physical object could, in essence, become an NFT. And now I'm just sick and tired of us fawning upon, all right, so this many millions went there, went there. I mean, this is adoption, but it's topsy-turvy adoption. It's celebrated by the 1%, mostly. And my advice to viewers at home, please do your own research before you invest or you take a deeper dive into NFTs. We'll try to educate you as much as possible, but please keep your wits about you and know that you're right in the middle of the storm. Still a lot to uncover. Yeah. As always, this has been the flip side of crypto. If you have any more questions for me and Tor, please put them down below. Tor, what's your uh, Twitter handle? At Torcon. Pretty simple. T-O-R-C-O-N. And to follow DailyCoin, it's at ReadDailyCoin. See you in the next episode.